Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me sin and the peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings are mine with ten thousand thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me Amen. I hope that that's true, something that you understand. And I hope that you sang that as a prayer to God who is nothing but good and faithful to us. Uh, a wonderful song. Thank you so much for your singing. We're going to open up our service uh, this morning with a word of prayer. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Mark, would you open us in prayer today? Amen. You can uh, be seated. I want to go over our announcements real quick. We do have a, a good handful of them, so bear with us. Uh, this upcoming Tuesday evening, we do have a ladies' fellowship here at the church. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. If you're planning on coming, uh, please uh, sign up uh, to let Miss Jamie and the others know uh, so that they'll know how many to prepare for. Uh, October the 17th, there is a junior activity from 11 to 2. Uh, do you have the... It's at uh, Brother Nick and Miss Noatis' house from 11 to to, and uh, that uh, activity, there is no cost for the juniors. Uh, and again, uh, anybody working with or knowing uh, any of the, the bus kids that uh uh, that are in the juniors group, uh, they are invited as well, even though we aren't running our buses for church uh, yet. Uh, so make note of that. October the 18th, uh, Sunday morning after the morning worship service, uh, the King's Daughters will be meeting in the, in the kitchen area downstairs. October the 25th through the 28th is what? 
Revival. Amen. I hope that you are praying for that and excited about it. Uh, I know that uh, uh, I could uh, use some revival. I could use uh, the Lord stirring in my heart and in my life uh, and excitement just for being a child of God and being called into his service and excitement about his work that he's trying to accomplish. Him being the light of the world and yet this world being so dark. It's exciting that we are vessels that get to carry the light. And so uh, we need uh, that uh, re, uh, revival inside of us an excitement for it. And so uh, I, I'm excited about what the Lord has for us with uh, Brother Stephen Brackeen as he'll be preaching Sunday uh, through Wednesday. And uh, on Wednesday, we'll have a, a special thing he's going to do for our kids. And so we're uh, uh, all of our families were really encouraging to be here for that. Uh, but uh, please, uh, if at all possible, make plans to be here, uh, attend as many services as possible uh, through that. And I promise that uh, you won't uh, regret it in any way. Uh, there's a uh, uh, ladies retreat at Beacon Baptist Church, November the 13th uh, through the 14th. The sign up sheet for that is available in the foyer. Uh, the last week in October, we are doing our revival and then all through the month of November. This is something we uh, haven't put in the bulletin. It'll be there next week, but all through the month of November, uh, we are going to uh, have a, a missions emphasis month, something that we had planned on the calendar over the summer, but because of COVID, we were still meeting outside the month that we uh, we're planning on having that, uh, but we have rescheduled it for November and uh, we're going to have an offering during that time, giving and uh, giving thanks for uh, missions by way of uh, financial. And uh, so uh, we'll let you know more about that as it becomes available, but we will have a different preacher every Sunday night or a different missionary uh, every Sunday night. And so we're real excited about that and uh, be praying for it uh, with us, if you will. Uh, December the 30th through January the 1st is uh, the Mid-Atlantic Youth Conference. Uh, sign up sheet in the foyer for that uh, as well. Uh, and the sooner that we get uh, young folks signed up, obviously the better uh, to make preparations for uh, uh, the numbers that we do have. The last thing is a uh, sign up sheet in the uh, foyer uh, if you would like to help clean up on Sunday afternoons between service uh, to keep the germ spread down, uh, we would encourage you to do so. Uh, we can give you all, the, all that you need and all the direction that you need to get that accomplished, but uh, that uh, is available in the foyer. Uh, we also have, go ahead and stand up, Brother Nick. I know I said last of all, uh, or last thing, but we are uh, starting up choir uh, practice this evening. And so if you are in the choir or would like to become a part of the choir, we are meeting tonight at, uh, at five o'clock uh, for choir. And then I also didn't mention Patch the Pirate performance tonight. Brother Nick? Anything else? Uh, I hope not. Let's all stand together. We'll sing this last song. I'm Christ, the solid rock I stand. Worship with me together this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I'm Christ, the solid rock I stand on ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand when darkness seems to hide his face i rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on christ the solid rock i stand on the ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Thank you for your great singing. Amen. If you will, uh, please take your Bibles, open them up to the book of John, chapter number 8. John, chapter number 8. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8, uh, maybe a familiar section of Scripture to most. 
Uh, but uh, w the Lord, as, as, uh, as I was reading through this and looking at what it is that he would have for us today, I was drawn to this because uh, we talked about last week how, uh, how uh, every decision that we make, every decision we make is an opportunity of, uh, of serving the Lord or maybe serving ourselves or uh, whatever it is. It's an opportunity for us to be an example for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and, and as I uh, thought about those things and uh, thought about what all our country and our world really is going through at this time, uh, I, I was drawn to an understanding that, uh, that as we face every one of these decisions and we face every one of these choices in our life on a daily basis, we are coming up against a fork in the road of our life and how with this choice, it's going to lead us uh, to a specific destination. Uh, as we live this life, we need to live it to the fullness and uh, as a child of God, we need to live it for him and make the most of, of his name and uh, uh, I, I understand that every minute that we've been given, every, uh, every choice that we make is an awesome opportunity, it's an awesome privilege that we have. Uh, a handful of different folks uh, uh, making uh, quotes, Theodore Roosevelt said this, nothing worth having comes easy. If we're living a life based on what's easy or based on what comes easy to us, where is it going to lead? There's multiple people that are given, the, uh, given credit for, uh, for this quote. Anything worth doing is worth doing right. I know my mom used to say that to me all the time. As, as a young person, I would have chores when I got home. And when she would get home, they, uh, she would inspect it and see how good of a job I did. And if it wasn't a good enough job up to her standard, guess what? I had to do it again. And she would always say, Cody, if it was worth doing the first time, if it was worth doing, it was, it's worth doing right. And uh, taking that a, a step further, uh, Shane Patton, uh, a famous military man of our age, it says, uh, anything in life that is worth doing is worth overdoing. Moderation is for cowards. Amen. Understand this, as far as our walk and as far as uh, the journey through this life into eternity, uh, everything that we do, every choice that we make is a choice uh, that must be made absolutely on purpose and must be uh, made with ambition and must be uh, made with goals or uh, the future in mind. Our life is a journey that starts at conception. Amen? Our life... Life is, our, is a journey that starts at conception and ends the day that we take our last breath. That's our life here in this earth. There are those that say life is short. There are those that say life is hard. There are those that say life is uncertain. And definitely there are those that say life is limited because the reality is we only have one to live. If this is true, we should make every minute count. We should make every de decision or every choice on purpose and with caution. You see, in our journey through this life, we are faced uh, with many different forks in the road of our, uh, of our life or of our journey Every decision that we make is a fork. Every choice that we make is a fork. Uh, every uh, obstacle we come up against, it's an opportunity for us to do the right thing or the wrong thing. Am I going to go this way or that way? Every one of the choices and decisions that we make are of the utmost importance because the direction that we choose to go determines our final destination. Every decision, every choice we make determines where we will end up. When Jamie and I uh, uh, moved to Michigan from Arizona, uh, we packed up everything that we had uh, in a U-Haul and sent it off with uh, some deacons from the church. And uh, we had a little car and uh, we got in that car and we drove it from Arizona all the way to Michigan. That's a long journey. Well, this was before the days, and I know our young folks over here, you, you might not understand this. This is before the days of GPS. We had to use these paper things called maps. And uh, it would tell us, uh, it would show us uh, where we started and the, uh, uh, the roads we got to take to get where we wanted to go. But we also had 
MapQuest on the internet. Y'all remember MapQuest? I would give you detailed instructions on how to get from point A to point B. Well, we printed up off of MapQuest how to get from Mesa, Arizona to Pontiac, Michigan, the place that we were moving in, the place where our truck, uh, our moving truck was already parked. Uh, well, we get in the, uh, the car and make this journey. We stopped in Colorado for, for a day and uh, saw some, uh, some friends there and, and uh, got to see a missions church. But uh, then we finished that journey and you, uh, we took that the directions that were given on MapQuest and we took our map which was uh, it wasn't a detailed map and so that was part of the issue uh, but we took every one of those directions that MapQuest had given us and it got us from Pontiac Michigan or from uh, from Mesa Arizona uh, all the way to just about 30 miles from Pontiac Michigan uh, by the way it, uh, it was one turn it was one misturn that made us sit in a parking lot of a Home Depot while we called everybody, every number we had from the church, the preacher, the deacons, everybody uh, waiting on somebody to tell us what we needed to do uh, to get to that final destination. It was one wrong turn that it took us all along the way. And so obviously uh, we need to follow directions and make every, uh, every decision and every choice. And at every turn in the road, we need to be making the right choice. But it's important for us to understand also uh, about finishing well. We, we got all the way to Michigan and fell short of our destination. That was a long trip for nothing, amen? But understanding uh, that every choice, uh, choices, uh, even as age or even as mature and long-term Christians, we still have the opportunity of messing up and messing up royally. Amen. In our passage today, uh, uh, I want to take a look at three different roads or pathways that each of us have the opportunity of taking and really where they lead. John chapter 8, we're going to start in verse number 1. It says, Jesus went out unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and uh, he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law uh, commanded us that we should, or that she, or I'm sorry, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? And they, uh, this they said, tempting him, being Jesus, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he had heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they uh, which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, uh, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman uh, standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman. Uh, uh, he said unto her, woman... Where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. We can see very, uh, three very different people, so there are three very different pathways uh, or roads that can be taken uh, in life and where it is that they lead. We see it in Jesus. We see it in the, uh, the woman taken in adultery. We see it in the, uh, the life and the actions of the scribes and the Pharisees. And it's important for us uh, to make sure we end up on the right road because we want to end up at the right destination. Let's pray and ask God to bless us in the rest of our, uh, the message this uh, morning. God in heaven, we thank you for today, for your goodness and love, the opportunity of being in your house. Lord, we thank you for uh, Sunday school hour and speaking to all of our hearts. We thank you for the, uh, the worship time as we have come together and lifted up praise and glory and honor in your name and uh, sang about how good and amazing you've been to us. 
Lord, we've taken your word, we've read a portion of scripture, and Lord, we're asking that you would continually bless us with your presence and your power, that you would speak to every heart, that you would speak on the inside as I speak on the outside. Lord, I pray you would help me not to be a powerless preacher this morning, but help me uh, preach under the authority and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and God, give us what we stand in need of today. Lord, we ask these things in your blessing and holy name, amen. As we uh, see these different pathways or these different roads or uh, as we come to these crossroads in our life and the choices that we make, the first pathway I want to uh, draw our attention to is the path pathway of self-righteousness. This, the, the, the pathway or the idea or the mentality of the self-righteous is, is really uh, to live a life on easy street. I have all of this under control. I have nothing to worry about uh, because of uh, what I have done or what I can do. The reality is, as we look at the, uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, as they bring this woman who's been caught in adultery, uh, and they uh, bring this woman who's been caught in the middle of sin, they present her before Jesus to try to trip him up and to try to, uh, to get him to say something that they could hold against them. But all along the way, we see through the, uh, the action and the response of Jesus that these men were living a self-righteous lifestyle. By the way, child of God, if we're not careful, we can end up on this same pathway of self-righteousness. Oh, well, I would never do that. And I can't believe what they've been uh, caught up in. And I can't believe the decisions that they made. I can't believe what's happening in their home. And, and we fail to see that if, if it weren't for the grace and mercy of God, that we too could be in the same position. This life or this uh, roadway of self-righteousness, am I going to choose uh, what seems right to me or am I going to uh, choose to be who and what God has called me to be? This, uh, I say it's living on easy street because the reality is a life of self-righteousness is an easy life to live. Why? Because it's easy to be critical of others. Amen. It's easy for us to be critical of somebody else, of uh, uh, the situation that they're in, of the, the mess that they've made or uh, the, 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 the hardship that they're going through. It's easy for us to be critical because... A critical spirit comes natural to humanity. Fault finding comes natural. Well, we, do, we don't want to make the same mistakes of others. I can understand that. We don't want to uh, go down a, a pathway of, uh, of wrongdoing. We don't want to end up in a, a horrible place. So sometimes we uh, use our mind, our intellect, what we're given of Scripture to try to understand what's best, uh, uh, what's good, uh, what's better, and what's best. But that doesn't mean that we've been given the opportunity or been called to be critical of any other individual. Fault finding comes natural. But on this, at, uh, at the same time, it's important for us as children of God to understand that fault finding, though we may act like it is or treat it like it is, fault finding is not a spiritual gift. God hasn't called us to find the faults in everybody else. He hasn't called us to, uh, to, to run them down or uh, to be critical or judgmental over the, the situation that they find themselves in. Yeah, we can uh, tell a fruit tree by the fruit that it bears. We can see uh, th th that if they don't live right and do right, that, uh, that, that we need to treat them in a way that points them to salvation. We can understand that, but we're not the judge. If you look all the way down at the end, Jesus says, neither do I judge you. Why? Because God's word is the judge. He's given us his law. He's given us the understanding. It's already recorded. It's not God's calling in any of our life to judge another's sin. God hasn't called any of us to be uh, fault finders. He, uh, fault finding is not a spiritual gift. What we can understand about uh, over and over and over through history, even through uh, scriptures, that fault, fighting le uh, fault finding leads to sin. What is the biggest sin that results in fault finding? Misery loves company, right? We've heard that before. Fault finding leads to gossip. Can you believe? Can you believe what they did? Now, I don't have all the answers and uh, I haven't gone and talked to them yet, but uh, this is what uh, somebody told me that told them that knows them and this is where they find themselves. Gossip. 
running folks down. If someone is in a hardship and we're talking about them and we're not a part of the, uh, the solution or we're not trying to help, then we are a part of the problem. It's not God's calling in our life uh, uh, to find faults in others and to, uh, to gossip about them. It's easy being critical because those things come natural to us, right? Fault finding ruins relationships. Fault finding splits churches. Fault finding ruins families and uh, drives wedges uh, between siblings and parents and their children. Fault finding causes disunity. By the way, if we, are, uh, if we recognize that fault finding leads to, uh, to sin and uh, we know that, uh, that one of those sins is gossip and, and we recognize that, uh, uh, that that fault finding and that gossip at least to disunity, you know what the Lord has to say about those who sow discord amongst the believers? Amongst the children of God? I'll go ahead and tell you if you don't already know, it's not a pretty picture. God judges uh, uh, using righteous judgment, but God judges uh, their life and judges uh, their eternal destination or judges their usefulness or judges uh, based on uh, what they'll go through in this life based on the amount of compassion that they have for the other guy. If you are judgmental and are focused on finding faults, the Lord will be, will be judgmental towards you and point out every one of your faults. It's easy being critical. The pathway of the self-righteous live on easy street because it's easy being critical. We can see as we, uh, as we go through this, as the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, they bring this woman caught in adultery and say, look, uh, the law of Moses says that we should stone her. What do you think we should do, Jesus? They did it to trip him up. These self-righteous individuals living on easy street found it easy to be critical of the woman that was caught in adultery. But it's not just easy being critical as far as the self-righteous are concerned. It's also easy being callous. Verses 7 and 8 said, So uh, when they continued asking him, he lifted uh, up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, stooped down and wrote on the ground. Here's what Jesus says. All of us are guilty. None of us are righteous on our own. Uh, none of you uh, uh, can, can live a life of perfection. And uh, none of you can say that you are without sin. You are just as guilty as she is. She is caught in the, uh, the act of adultery. She's caught in sin. But all of us are guilty. It's easy for us to become callous over our own wrongdoing, isn't it? To overlook the fact that I have sinned against God. To overlook the fact that, uh, that I'm not doing or acting in the way that I'm supposed to. It's easy to be callous in that way. Just as the uh, scribes and the Pharisees were callous to their own wrongdoing. It's easy for me to justify my wrongdoing. Well, I know this is what scripture says, but this is the way that I see it. And I know that this is a absolute truth, but, uh, but I just don't think it applies to me or I don't think it applies in this situation. We can justify away anything that we feel like justifying away. But if it thus saith the Lord, it is thus saith the Lord. He doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we as Christians can grow callous and overlook our own sin, justify our sin away, or even downplay our sin. We make a joke out of things that are serious in the eyes of God. Uh, we laugh about it and we think that it's not a big deal. Sin is a big deal. God takes every one of them serious. Sin is what separates us from God. Downplaying our sin, being callous over our wrongdoing, making a joke about it doesn't do us any good. It steers us further away from God. We can grow callous to our sin and our wrongdoing by comparing ourselves. That's kind of what we see uh, the scribes and the Pharisees doing. Look, no matter what anybody says, I, I, you know, I know what the Ten Commandments say and I do my best to live by them. And uh, there are times that I'm guilty of it, but I can tell you this. I'm not guilty like she's guilty. I'm not guilty like they're guilty. I haven't made a mistake like that. And we justify our sin and we, uh, we joke about our sin and we grow callous to our own wrongdoing. We say uh, judgment is reserved for that kind of person. And all along we are harboring wrongdoing in our own lives. 
because we've grown callous. It's easy to grow callous and compromise on what we know is the right thing. The self-righteous live on easy street because it's easy to be critical. It's easy to be callous. And the last thing we see as far as the self-righteous is that it's easy to be cowardice. Look at verses, uh, uh, verse number nine. And they which heard it being convicted. You know what that word means? Or, uh, uh, that, that word convicted means that they came to an understanding uh, that what Jesus was saying, what was being pointed out in their life falls in line with everything that I was just talking about, that they themselves are guilty. He says, look, Jesus said, uh, those that are without sin, those that haven't done any wrong through their life, you, you go ahead and you cast that first stone is what Jesus says. And because they recognized their own wrongdoing and their own guilt, uh, they felt conviction of their own conscience. Uh, it says that they went out one by one, being at the uh, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was us alone and the woman standing in the midst. Instead of coming to an understanding and admitting they're wrong, instead of uh, confessing their sin, and instead of uh, realizing or recognizing or vocalizing their own wrongdoing in trying to condemn this woman who was caught in the act of adultery, they acted like cowards and just left. They were confronted with their wrongdoing and instead of uh, confession, instead of saying, uh, you're right, and instead of admitting or owning up to it, they hung their head, and when attention was taken off them, they exited out the back as quiet as possible. As far as the sin that's in our life, how is it that we're cowardice uh, as the Word of God, as the preacher of God, as the uh, Holy Spirit of God, as uh, God Himself reveals things in our life that are wrong? We're cowardice in the way that we avoid it. We avoid dealing with it. We know that sin, uh, public sin requires public confession. We know that when we do wrong, we've got to approach the throne of grace and ask for mercy. That's, a, that's, a, that's an opportunity that's been made available to us. That is absolutely uh, an amazing thing that all of us can do going to God. But we say, you know what? I know that I did wrong. Man, I ain't going to do that anymore. And instead of going to God and confessing and asking for forgiveness, uh, we make a, a fleshly, self-righteous decision to avoid going back down that road. Now, it's for the right reasons, but it's the wrong way. That's cowardice. It's, it's God's design. It's God's plan that when we sin, we approach his throne of grace so that we can obtain mercy, confession, going along with belief, confession going along with repentance. Uh, but we can grow callous to uh, our cowardice towards sin by avoiding our own guilt, by putting it off as far as putting off getting right. I know I'm not the best preacher in the world, but I know that the power of God abides in this place and his word doesn't return void. I know that the power of God rests in this pulpit and that uh, uh, when the word of God is preached, that it changes, it pierces to the heart of every individual. The word of God is it's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing to the, uh, or piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, that the word of God in and of itself is convicting. And yet uh, week after week, time after time, service after service, we see a lack of participation in the time of invitation. Why? Because we want to put off what God is placing right in front of our faces. We've grown callous or cowardice uh, towards our own wrongdoing, our uh, lack of willingness to be what God's called us to be. Uh, we walk away from our own guilt. We sweep it under the rug. We uh, turn a deaf ear as the Holy Spirit is speaking to us on the inside. Uh, we have grown cowardice to our own wrongdoing when God's made available the opportunity of grace and mercy. The pathway of the self-righteous is that they live on easy street because it's easy being critical, it's easy being callous, and it's easy being cowardice. But I said at the beginning, we're going to look at the different pathways uh, as we come to these forks in the road. We're going to look at the different pathways, and remember, we're looking at where they lead. The easy way leads to disappointment. 
The scribes and the Pharisees, though that continue, those that continue to trust in their own self-righteousness, when they came to the end of who they are, when they came to the end of, uh, of their life, when it came time for them to stare eternity in the face, they were left disappointed because they trusted in their own righteousness and not the righteousness of Christ. And they were separated as uh, like the wheat from the tear. They were cast into outer darkness and they will spend an eternity separated from God. That's not the preacher being hard-hearted or mean. That's what thus say the Lord. We grow callous and we go uh, cowardice and we, uh, we, we're critical of everybody else's sin, but we're not, uh, we don't address our own sin. We live in self-righteous, uh, with a self-righteous attitude uh, and that self-righteous attitude always leads to disappointment because though we may feel self-righteous, the Bible tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. The second pathway that we see here that, is to, uh, that, that we can take is the pathway of, a, of the sinner. These are those that travel a rough road. When you look at the woman that was caught in adultery, and you consider the embarrassment and the shame what it was that brought her to that place and what it was uh, uh, that she was facing as they were, uh, they were no doubt saying uh, and uh, whispering and talking amongst themselves about uh, the joy that they would take in executing the, uh, the judgment on this woman who had done this heinous thing. Put yourself in the position of this woman who had made a mistake, who had made a huge mistake and was living out that mistake in front of everybody. That's a rough road to live on. That's a rough road to travel on. It's uncomfortable to be caught in our own wrongdoing. It's uncomfortable to be called to the carpet when we've fallen short. It's a rough road to live on when we come face to face with our guilt. Because the Bible says that we're all guilty. And not just that we're all guilty, but that God, our righteous, our sovereign God, uh, who's omniscient and uh, omnipresent and uh, uh, omnipotent, He knows everything, He sees everything, He's everywhere at the same time. He knows our heart, He knows our mind, He knows what we think of, uh, what we dwell on, He knows what we look at when nobody else is around, He knows what we fixate on, He knows the attitude that we have towards others, He knows the attitude we have towards other Christians and the lost, whatever the case may be. He knows our heart heart. And if the reality is that none are guilty, we have to recognize with that if we believe in a sovereign God, and I do because the Bible teaches that we have a sovereign God, that nothing is hidden. So our guilt is ever before him. We can't say, God, I didn't mean to do it because he knows our heart. We can't say uh, that it's not as bad and uh, uh, that I'm not as guilty as the guy next to me because God knows our heart. Nothing is hidden to God. It's an uncomfortable uh, road to live on when we're caught in the act. And we can see that in the woman caught in adultery. It's an uncomfortable road or pathway to be on when you're facing condemnation for your own wrongdoing. We are all guilty. Nothing is hidden before God. But we also all must give an answer to God as to the reason uh, for uh, the decisions that we make. And by the way, nothing will be overlooked. We can't say, God, I did this much for you between the years of 2006 and 2010. Or 2010 and as a result of that, I'm asking you to overlook what happened afterwards. It's not how it works. We're all guilty. We all must uh, give an answer. Nothing is hidden before God and nothing will be overlooked. That's why it's an uncomfortable wor uh, road to live on. It's uncomfortable to, be, to live uh, having been caught and condemned for our own wrongdoing. And that's what we can see in the life of the woman caught in adultery. As we get to the end, we see uh, Jesus giving her an understanding to, to go and sin no more and he tells her that I'm not going to condemn you uh, just as nobody else has, has stayed. They've all been cowardice and went their own way. I'm not going to condemn you, but go and sin no more. 
as Jesus is riding in the sand, it doesn't tell us, or in the dirt, what it is that he's riding. Uh, it doesn't give us a, uh, an understanding of every single thing that was said there. Just It gives us an understanding uh, of the main points of what happened. The reality is when Jesus uh, tells her to go and sin no more, he is telling her, you need to change the life that you're living. Why? Because of the decisions that you've made when you came to those forks in the road and you had choice and you had opportunity. You took the way of selfishness. You took the way of the flesh. And that's what has led you here. It's not God. It's not any other person. It's not, uh, you can't blame it. You can't uh, push it off on anybody else. It's a result of your decision making that you're in the position that you're in. So Jesus is telling her, you need to make a change if you want to end up at a different destination. If you don't want to be here uncomfortable uh, based on being called and uh, based on uh, the condemnation that comes along with your wrongdoing, it's uncomfortable to, uh, to do what it is Jesus is asking her to do. It's uncomfortable to go through, uh, through that change of uh, the old creature to the new creature, uh, but it comes with an understanding that we must commit ourselves to the cause and that we must hold nothing back. It's either all or nothing. We've got to fully commit to being different, to changing our lives. We've got to be fully committed, and that's an uncomfortable road to live on. It's a blessed road to live on, but it's uncomfortable, isn't it? We see with that also an understanding that it's uncomfortable to be charged based on uh, what it is that Jesus says to her, her sin being ever before her, Jesus knowing what she was guilty of because the scribes and the Pharisees have laid it out. You can't live that way. You can't live that way and expect a different outcome. You can't live that way and, and feel blessed. You can't live that way and trust that the Lord is just going to bail you out of the situations that you find yourself in, uh, that you have put yourself in. You can't do that and expect God to be okay with it. So as he is charging her, as he is uh, giving her an understanding of her need of change, he says uh, that, that she must change and that nothing in, the, in her life, and nothing as far as her uh, process of decision making, none of that can stay the same. It can't be about you anymore and what makes you happy and you comfortable. If you're going to end up in a different place, if you're going to end up at a different destination than the uh, standing, being accused and being caught in the act, uh, if you're going to end up somewhere else than paying the penalty of your own wrongdoing, you've got to change. By the way, that's a picture of salvation, amen? It's Jesus Christ to, uh, making us a new creature that allows us to, uh, to experience that change, that allows us uh, to have that new uh, outlook on life and have those new ambitions. It's Jesus Christ who makes that change in us, but it's our willingness to allow the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the mercy and grace provided, the hope that's given the adoption into his family. It's uh, all that hope that lies in all those promises that allows us to be committed to that change. Easy street. The pathway of the self-righteous is easy street because it's easy to live that self-righteous judgmental lifestyle. The pathway of the sinner is a rough way. The road is rough, uneven, full of potholes, uncomfortable. And if we stay on that road, it will lead to destruction. The last thing we're going to look at is the pathway of the Savior. Those who have done what uh, Jesus Christ is uh, referring to here, those that have committed themselves to that change, those that have accepted the challenge and the charge of Jesus of going and sinning no more, those who have uh, confessed their sin and believe and trusted in and, and purposely put themselves on a different path, those that uh, were going one direction and now have repented and are going another direction. This is the pathway towards Christ-likeness. And I would love to say that this was an easy pathway, but we can recognize that it's, it's the road less traveled. 
The pathway of the Savior is the, uh, the, the road of, uh, of hard knocks at times. Here's what Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 say. Enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. The easy way leads to destruction. And many there be that go therein, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Uh, the life of Christ's likeness, the life of Christianity, the life of devotion uh, to Almighty God, it's not a life for the faint of heart. It's a life of commitment. It's a life uh, that come, uh, brings with it trials and temptation and assault from an enemy. Uh, we see in these verses uh, that the broad way, the easy way, that rough way uh, uh, that, that everybody seems to be on, it leads to destruction. But that hard way, no, it's not easy, is a way that leads to blessing. The presence of God. It's a highway to heaven, so to speak. We see in what Jesus went through, Jesus being the Son of God, God with us, uh, uh, the, uh, Jesus uh, being the, uh, the mouthpiece for God and uh, being the embodiment of God amongst the people and everything He says, He says with love and everything He says, He says with truth and honesty and everything He says holds every bit of weight that, we, that, a, uh, that a word could possibly hold with it and Jesus is being challenged and Jesus is being confronted. This isn't the first or the last time that the scribes and the Pharisees would try to trip him up and to try to uh, trap him in his words. Uh, this, uh, this wasn't the last time that he was going to face uh, that kind of persecution. It wasn't the last time that he was going to face trial uh, and temptation. It wasn't the last time that Jesus would show compassion when he himself was in the midst of a hard situation. We can see in the life and the legacy of Jesus Christ. When we look at all that he went through, it can be hard as a Christian to continually be challenged. It would be hard in that kind of situation where they're trying to twist our words and to try to twist the situation uh, to try to, uh, to rope me into or uh, to trap me, uh, corner me in a with my words so that they can tear my life apart. That would be hard. We can understand that, right? Have you ever had your words used against you? You can understand that. It's hard for, uh, for an individual to continually be challenged and not react poorly. But that's what Jesus does. It would be hard for us to continually be challenged and not uh, 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 respond by stooping to their level. How many times have we said when, uh, when we see somebody acting like a fool, if they were acting like that to me, uh, they would be having problems. Me and them would be having real words. And uh, we, we use phrases like if they say something like that to me, they'll be picking their teeth up off the floor, right? It's hard to continually over and over and over be challenged and not stoop to their level. It's, not, uh, to, it's hard for us to continually be challenged uh, based on our uh, dedication to the Lord and not reveal some sort of shortcoming in our life. It's hard for us to continually be challenged in our devotion to God and not want to give up. It's a hard road. It's hard to remain calm when everything going on around us with the assault against the family and life and morals at the forefront of every news broadcast, it's hard for us to remain calm. But isn't that what we saw Jesus doing when he was confronted and when he was challenged and when they were trying to trap him? It's hard to remain calm when we're under attack. It's hard to, uh, to be calm when put on the spot. It's hard to be calm when allegations are, are coming our way and uh, we are agitated and we feel as though we're pressed on every side. It's hard to remain calm, but isn't that what we see Jesus doing? It's hard to, uh, to, be, uh, to continually be challenged. It's hard to remain calm. And, and at times in our Christian walk and as we go through this life, it's hard for us to continue to have compassion on others. When we see them making mistake after mistake, we want to say, look, 
It's of their own wrongdoing. It, it, they brought it upon themselves. If I'm the only one, I'll shut up. It's hard for us to remain compassionate. But he wasn't just compassionate towards this woman that was caught in adultery. He was also compassionate towards those that were accusing and trying to trap him. He, uh, he died for that woman just as he died for them. He offers salvation to, uh, to the woman caught in adultery, but he also offers salvation to the scribes and the Pharisees. He draws their attention to their own wrongdoing. He doesn't say, this is, what you're, uh, this is where you went wrong and this is how you've sinned and this is what you've done. He could have because he's God and he knows all things. He could have uh, drawn their attention to every wrong thing that they ever said or did or thought, but he doesn't do that. He simply says, look inside of yourself and those of you that are without sin cast the first stone. He doesn't come down on them with, uh, with hatred in his heart. He gives them an opportunity of understanding their need of the forgiveness that he alone is able to offer. It's hard to be compassionate towards our accusers, but that will, that's what we see Jesus doing. It's hard to be compassionate towards those who willingly commit to a life of sinfulness. The pathway towards Christ's likeness is the road less traveled. It's a hard road. But the hard way leads to an eternity of delight. We see the three different personalities in, in these verses. And we gain an understanding of, uh, of a message that, that, that the Lord is trying to help us understand. As we go through this life and we have choice and as we go through this life and we have opportunity and as we go through this life and we make decisions, make sure we make the decision that keeps us on the road to eternal life. Though it may be a hard road at times, it's the road that really leads to delight. It's the road that leads us to the destination that we want to find ourselves at. If we're living a life in opposition to God, that life of sin, it will lead us to destruction. If we're on that road of destruction, we need to change our ways, confess and commit and accept the salvation, accept the forgiveness offered by Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we will end up in eternal Devastation, destruction, damnation. If we're living on a road, if we're traveling through this life on a road of self-righteousness, understand that that road leads to disappointment. The pathway of the Savior, the hard road, that's the one that leads to life eternal. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Few there be that are willing to endure that. But that's the only road that leads to life. So the choice is ours. We must make it. We can't count on anybody or anything else. As we come to these forks in the road, uh, day after day, moment after moment, choice after choice, decision after decision, are we going to make the decision that keeps us on that hard road that leads to an eternal delight and uh, eternal uh, uh, glory, eternal heaven, uh, the eternal presence of God? Are we going to remain on the hard road that leads there? Or are we going to take the easy uh, way, the rough road that uh, leads to personal pleasure but leads to destruction? Which road are we going to take? We have one life to live. And as mama would say, anything that's worth doing is worth doing right. If we're going to live this life, let's live it the right way. If we're going to go through this life, if we're going to journey through this life, let's do it the right way. Not focused on me, not focused on others, but focused on Christ. Christ. 